Anyway, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Federico Razzoli. I am a database consultant. This is my uh, usual uh, initial commercial slide. I will forever deny that it contains subliminal messages to make you buy my services. Um, so let's proceed. Okay, so this is the agenda of the, of the webinar. We will talk about uh, the different types of MySQL and MariaDB backups, um, their characteristics and what they are good for and what are the problems with the various types. Um, we will not dig too much about the technical details of each solution. We will only aim to understand how they work. Um, we will also talk a bit about planning backups strategies properly and how to test, how and why to test backups. Uh, I see the question. Uh, yes, I will share the slides. And about questions, I'm happy with you asking questions in the chat as I go. Um, if there is time, I will try to answer at the end. If there is not enough time, um, I will probably publish a follow-up in a written form later. Anyway, let's talk about planning backups. Um, so before planning backup strategies, you should evaluate the costs and the risks, and then you can define the strategies. So about costs, uh, you have to keep in mind that um, anything that increases uh, the reliability of your IT infrastructure, including backups, of course, costs money and doesn't directly produce money. Managers always keep this in their mind. Uh, so when you propose something to them, <laughs> they will keep in mind that you are not proposing something that will earn money. Um, but disasters have the same characteristic. They also cost money and produce absolutely nothing good. So, of course, we should reduce the probability that a disaster happened. It is impossible to completely avoid disasters, um, but it is possible to uh, make them unlikely and limit the damage they make. And limit the damage they make means to implement serious backup strategies. So the next question, of course, is, okay, but what is the right amount of money that it is correct to spend for backups? Um, so you have to keep in mind uh, to answer that data loss also has costs. Um, some costs can be actually measured, um, probably with the help of, uh, you know, uh, analysts and data science people. Um, they can measure the cost to uh, reacquire the data if it is possible. And if it is not possible, the cost of services and products that cannot be sold because of the data loss. Because, for example, maybe you lose customer uh, details and so on. And also you have to keep in mind that some customer uh, spend money uh, during the course of their life, um, spend money with your services. And when you lose them forever, you lose their whole um, lifetime value. Uh, there are also costs that are uh, much more difficult or impossible, most probably impossible to measure, like uh, the damage to the reputation of the company, um, candidates that are disappointed and decide uh, not to work for you. And there are also downtime costs, uh, downtime because you know, if you lose data, uh, some time elapses before the services can go up again. And in the meanwhile, you are unable to uh, sell services. Uh, the website is off. Uh, again, you can lose some customers forever and you lose their lifetime value. And again, uh, there is a reputation damage. Uh, the Google rank of your website can decrease. Uh, candidates can be disappointed and so on. So uh, the next step is evaluate the risks. 
because uh, you know when you talk about backups it's very easy to say something like well if data is lost but this is not a risk this is just a generic concern um, risks are something more complete like concrete like for example we drop a wrong table by mistake uh, application has a bug so maybe it deletes some data that are useful or a table gets corrupted during a write which is something that uh, happens sometimes or the disks get corrupted and so on uh, there are many more uh, risk types these are just examples uh, but the thing is different risks are prevented in different ways uh, meaning with different types of backups um, so defining backup strategies first of all um, we need to take some decisions like for example uh, how the backup is taken using which tool uh, how often uh, the backup is taken and where the backup is stored for how much time uh, for how much time mm, the backup process can take because if it takes too much well it can be a problem for us um, how much space the backup can take on the disk because if it takes more it can be a problem because we are spending too much uh, especially if we decide to uh, keep several old versions of the backups um, how much time it takes to restore a backup this is um, very easy to understand because uh, we don't want the restore to take uh, too many hours if we cannot afford it if the customers expect our our website to be uh, online again uh, soon uh, but of course these numbers are very very deep dependent on the type of services you offer uh, uh, so you can also see that some of these numbers are kind of interdependent uh, so just to make an example, you can, for example, decide that um, the latest backup is stored on disk locally, uncompressed, just because in this way it will be faster to restore it if needed. But then, um, of course, this will not save us in the case the local disk gets corrupted. This is what I mean when I say that different backup strategies uh, deal with different types of incidents okay so for this reason we can have for example uh, seven older backups which are taken daily uh, and we can store them in amazon s3 or whichever other service we decide and we can have of course more types of backups so let's go forward and let's talk about backup types um, there are several classifications of backups that I'm going to say, not just because I love classifications, but because they are useful to understand which types of backup you should choose and why. Uh, so a first classification is cold backup or hot backup. A cold backup is a backup that you take when MySQL is down. Okay, so you turn it off. Uh, and you take a backup. Uh, of course, this implies that there is a, a downtime, but at the same time, it is faster not just to take the backup, but also to restore the backup. Okay. Uh, a hot backup is, of course, a backup which is taken while MySQL is running. The downside is that there will be a slowdown for the server and also the backup process is more complex, meaning that there are more things that could go wrong. Uh, other classification is uh, physical vs. logical backups. So a physical backup is a copy of certain files and directories that are important to uh, set up again the database. Um, so usually it takes more space of course because it includes indexes and uh, doing it while the server is running requires the use of some special tools that we are going to mention later 
a logical backup is a set of SQL statements that are needed to recreate uh, the database from scratch. Uh, a logical backup can, can only be hot. You cannot take it while uh, MySQL is down. Um, it can potentially be restored on any MySQL or MariaDB version. Of course, it depends because if you are using a, a feature that is only supported in the latest MySQL feature, uh, in the latest MySQL version, you will not be able to restore it on an older version and probably on MariaDB. Uh, but most of the times you can actually restore a dump on any version, any recent version. And you can even restore it on different SQL databases, uh, at least in theory. In practice, it is not always that simple. Um, also, it takes more time. Um, both taking a backup and restoring it, it takes more time. Uh, also, generally, you have uh, to take a decision. Uh, you want to take a consistent backup, then you have to run a long transaction, which causes can cause problem in production. Uh, or you can take an inconsistent backup, uh, but most of the times this is not an option. Anyway, mm, this is not completely true. Uh, we will mention later that there, is, there are tools to uh, avoid taking this decision. Another classification is complete backup, which includes all the data or partial backup which only includes some databases or some tables, or even uh, the result of a select. In this last case, it can only be a logical backup. Um, also, finally, the, the final classification, uh, a backup can be full or incremental. Full means that, uh, well, it is something that is always necessary. It is a backup of the data at a certain point in time. Uh, but taking a full backup mm, typically takes time. So maybe you take it, for example, every 24 hours. But this means that in case of disaster, you could lose up to 24 hours of data changes. Sometimes this is really not good. So you also may want to take incremental backups, uh, meaning that an incremental backup will include all the changes that happen since the last full backup or since the last incremental backup. Uh, so if you take, for example, two or three or four incremental backups uh, during the day, uh, hopefully you will never lose uh, 24 hours of data changes. So the next uh, topic is related to replication because uh, the way we mm, have replication in place, if we have it, affects the, the decisions we take about backups. So in case you use Galera or uh, Galera in the case of MariaDB or Percona server or group replication in the case of MySQL 8 uh, or Percona server, uh, well, this is a synchronous replication. And in this case, often it makes sense to leave one node unused and leave it only available for failover. This is unrelated to backup, but anyway, this is something that uh, a lot of people does, right? And in that case, you can use the unused node for the backups. Um, but if we use asynchronous slaves, well, it is a common practice to take backups from the slaves. But if you do so, remember, um, slaves can always lag. There is no guarantee that all slaves are up to date, or even that one slave is up to date. Uh, so sometimes this is not a problem, sometimes it is. Uh, so, for example, you could have a script that before taking a backup checks how much the slave is lagging, but of course this adds a lot of complexity. Um, so do it if it is necessary. Um, also, uh, keep in mind that MySQL and MariaDB support delayed replication, meaning that if I change uh, something now, 
it will be replicated, for example, in one hour. This is very useful because this means that if I drop a table by mistake, or if, if I drop the wrong table, uh, this will only happen in the slave in one hour. So I have one hour, one hour of time to stop replication in one slave and uh, take uh, the table from there and copy it again to the master. Uh, this is very useful in case of human mistakes. And basically, uh, in this case, we are using the delayed replica more or less as a form of backup. Uh, so let's talk uh, about um, the actual uh, types of backups that exist in MySQL. And let's start from the logical backups. Uh, so the most common tool to take logical backups is surely MySQL dump which is also the worst, and I will motivate this statement. Um, so MySQL dumps, uh, well, this is the syntax, and as you can see, uh, it generates a dump that you typically redirect to a file. Uh, that file then can be restored very easily simply by redirecting its content to the MySQL command line client or any other command line client. Um, the dump, of course, consists of uh, create table statements, create view statements, and so on, and then a series of insert statements to recreate the actual rows of a table. Uh, part of the syntax uh, in the create statements is enclosed in so-called executable statements. You can see two examples that are useful to explain what executable statements are. The first example, uh, okay, as you can see, it is actually a comment, right? But the first part of the comment says that, okay, Mr. Uh, database, if you are MySQL version eight or later, please execute this syntax. Uh, it is not a comment for you, okay? If you are not MySQL 8, then this is a comment for you. Ignore it, okay? The same version is similar, except there is an M, which stands for MariaDB. So the comment will be executed by MariaDB version 10.4.0. Uh, so dumps contain this syntax every time they include some feature that is not supported by uh, older versions of MySQL and MariaDB. So MySQL dump um, has a big problem. It is monothread, so it is slow. Take, taking a backup is slow. Um, so actually not just taking a backup, but also restoring a backup is slow because uh, the backup is a single dump file and to restore it, you have to um, send the whole file to a MySQL client, meaning that uh, restoring is also monothread. Um, also, the create table instructions include indexes, uh, therefore, when you restore it, uh, the table is created, the indexes are also recreated, the rows are inserted later, and this is slow. Um, to make it less slow, one should actually uh, create a table without indexes, then load all the rows, and after that, uh, you create the indexes, and this is much faster. But you cannot do this with MySQL dump. Um, so there are many options uh, which allow to include or exclude some databases or tables. There is a where option uh, which allows to dump the result of a select. Uh, there is no data which basically allows to only um, dump the structure of tables and not their contents. And this is very useful because it is always useful to also have a backup of tables structure. And then there are options to include or exclude triggers, routines, events, um, 
Okay, and typically you should use uh, the single transaction options, which basically uh, dumps, um, which basically dumps um, the, the the data uh, in a single transaction, uh, so the data will be consistent. Okay, um, I see that someone wrote. Uh, they can't see the slides. Uh, can someone confirm if the slides are visible? Okay, in the meanwhile, I continue. Oh, now are visible. Mm, okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, so another tool is MySQL Pump. The name is very similar. Uh, there is a P instead of a D. It comes with MySQL 5.7. It is not in MariaDB, and uh, it is very similar to MySQL dump, but it is created to overcome the limitations of MySQL dump. Um, so with MySQL pump, uh, you can basically use multiple threads to make, um, to make a dump, so it is much faster. Uh, the option, there is an option to compress the results of the files that is very useful simply because you cannot uh, pipe the, the command MySQL pump as you would do with MySQL dump. And indexes are created after all the inserts. Uh, so also reloading the dump is much faster. Um, another very nice thing in my opinion is that users are dumped with the statement create user and not by dumping um, the user system table from the MySQL database. Um, then there are there is this tool called my dumper which is from the community and basically it was created before MySQL pump uh, to allow a better parallelism. So typically when you call it, you use the threads uh, option to specify how many threads you want to use, typically one per core, and then how many rows uh, for each chunk. And this allows a good level of parallelism. Um, so you may wonder how it works. Uh, if there are many threads dumping the database, how can they obtain a consistent dump? Well, it uses a very nice trick, actually. Mm, first of all, when it's called, it starts a master thread, which connects to MySQL or MariaDB and runs uh, flush tables with red lock. Uh, these locks, for a brief time, um, all the writes to the tables. Then the worker threads connect to MySQL and run start transaction with consistent snapshots. So they obtain um, a snapshot, a view on the data, and then the master thread releases the lock on the tables and applications can work again. Um, this happens just in a fraction of a second. Uh, of course, it can still be a problem if your database is write intensive. Um, but it's probably the best thing it could do. Um, after the lock is released, of course, the worker threads can copy all the data. Keep in mind that if only one thread crashes, uh, the whole backup will be inconsistent. So let's proceed. Oh, okay, it has... Uh, options that are actually similar to the ones of MySQL dump and MySQL pump. So no data, options to include or exclude uh, triggers, routines, events, uh, compress the backup. Um, there is also an option that you can uh, use when you only backup in ODB tables. You can use uh, tier X uh, consistency only. This makes the backup faster. Uh, when you want to restart, uh, re restore uh, the backup, you can use uh, my loader, and again, you can use the thread option to make it multi-thread and faster. Um, just one note about not transactional tables, because whichever dump technique you use 
whichever tool you use, um, the tool will need to acquire logs on the tables to be able to um, dump them in a consistent way. Uh, this is, of course, a problem of scalability, and in most cases, it is a big problem. Um, another note about MariaDB temporal tables. This is a feature that basically allows to track how data change over time. Um, but the thing is, temporal tables have two columns which represent the timestamps when a row came to exist and when that version of the row ceased to exist. Um, these columns can be invisible, which is another MariaDB feature, but if you create them explicitly, then they will be visible to the user and to the dump tools. This means that uh, they are dumped just like any other column, and when you will try to restore uh, the dumps, um, the restore will fail uh, simply because it is not possible to explicitly write a value into uh, a temporal column. Uh, only MariaDB can do this automatically. But if you don't include those tables, well, you can actually restore the backup, but of course the original timestamp values uh, will be lost. Um, Okay, it is worth mentioning um, because, you know, you may have some special needs, so you may want to write a script which dumps the tables you need uh, with some logic that only you may know. Um, so it is worth mentioning that um, MySQL and MariaDB have these useful family of instructions, which are show databases, show tables, show views, and so on, which list the existing database tables, views, and so on. And then for each object you find, you can run, for example, show create database, show create table, and you will get um, the create instruction that is needed to recreate exactly the same database and the same table. Um, okay, next type of backup that I want to discuss is physical backups. So, um, physical backups uh, can be called, not necessarily, but they can be called. Um, so basically it means that you copy the files uh, to somewhere else while MySQL is not running. Um, it is not always completely true because maybe MySQL is running and you just stop replication temporarily and you run flash tables with red lock, which basically uh, acquires a global lock and the tables cannot be written by applications. And you make the copy and then you unlock the tables and restart the replication. Um, if you do so, well, first of all, this can be a problem because, of course, if if your workload is write intensive, the writes will queue uh, in the database, but also, you know, in the proxies, in the web server or whatever. Um, anyway, uh, to reduce the time you keep the lock, um, instead of copying all the files, you can take a snapshot. Um, so let's talk about snapshots. Snapshots are not a MySQL or MariaDB feature, but they can be implemented in underlying technologies. So for example, it is in the volume manager LVM, it is in the file system ZFS, uh, it can be in the virtual machine you use, in the container system you use, and so on. Of course, if you use a cloud provider, um, most probably your cloud, well, not most probably, but certainly your cloud provider uh, has a way to make snapshots. But check the documentation, please, to understand how they work. Uh, how does a snapshot work? Well, the details may change uh, depending on the technology, but the general rule is existing files are frozen, they are not written anymore or deleted, and uh, 
these files are actually the snapshots. Everything that changes afterward is written separately on separate physical files. This technique is called copy on write. Um, snapshots can also be incremental, which means that an incremental snapshot only contains the changes that happened since the last um, full snapshot or since the, light, the last um, incremental snapshot. Uh, so in this way, of course, the snapshot is smaller. Um, snapshots can be sent to other servers, which is very useful because you basically move them uh, to restore um, the, the snapshot elsewhere and make a copy of the data. Um, Windows uh, doesn't have uh, proper snapshots, but it has something very, very similar called shadow copies. I will not describe it. If you are a Windows user, uh, check Microsoft documentation, which is absolutely great. Um, restoring snapshots. Well, uh, when MySQLD uh, or the file system, underlying file system, uh, suddenly crashes, what happens? Well, of course, it will leave some inconsistent files, right? So if, in the case of InnoDB tables, uh, you don't lose data because data are flushed uh, first to the transaction logs. So the InnoDB tables can always be repaired using the transaction logs. And this is done automatically by MySQL and MariaDB on restart. Uh, well, automatically, not completely, but about this, please check MySQL documentation. Um, in the case of MyEisen tables and most other um, non-transactional storage engines, uh, the tables will lose the latest changes, meaning the changes that were not yet flushed to the disk. Um, only exception is ARIA storage engine, which is in MariaDB, but I'm not suggesting to use it anyway. Um, when you take a snapshot, it is actually the same because you suddenly froze, you suddenly freeze a, a copy of the, um, of the files and that copy will be inconsistent. So when you restore a backup, um, when you then restart MySQLD, um, the InnoDB tables will be repaired and uh, non-transactional tables will generally lose some data. So don't use um, non-transactional tables if you can. Uh, so let's briefly talk about an interesting InnoDB feature called uh, transportable table spaces. Um, Okay, you can see the syntax, but um, I'm not going to talk too much about the details because the time is short. But basically, the purpose of this feature is to be able to copy a table from one server to another. But actually, you can also use this technique uh, to take backup of some single tables, to be able to restore um, single tables. Uh, so as you can see from the syntax, when you do such a thing, you will briefly need to um, take um, a lock on, uh, on the table, both on the source server and also in the target servers. Um, let's talk about extra backup, which is, mm, in my opinion, the best backup tools uh, that exists currently. And uh, despite being the best, uh, it has some mm, problems that not everyone seems to know. So let's talk about it. Uh, so extra backup is basically a tool which copies files while the server is running. And it does that without locking uh, the InnoDB tables. Okay. Well, other types of tables will be locked for a small amount of time, um, but InnoDB tables will not. Um, so the tool is produced by, um, by, by Percona and uh, it focuses on MySQL and it only works on Linux. This means that 
it will not support MariaDB where it is not compatible with MySQL and it will not run on Windows, which is of course not completely true because nothing prevents you from running it inside a container or a virtual machine, but of course, this adds some uh, complexity. Uh, for this reason, Maria Backup exists. It is produced by uh, MariaDB team. It was introduced in MariaDB 10.1, and uh, basically it is a fork of Extra Backup 2.3, um, but it has some more features, and in particular, of course, it supports all MariaDB features. Um, I never tried it with MySQL, but I assume that uh, it is not a good idea to use it with MySQL. Um, it runs on both uh, Linux and Windows. Uh, uh, I see a question if I have tested um, uh, Piyush, but I, I don't know it, sorry. So, um, Extra Backup has a recent problem because um, MySQL 8.0.20, which was released uh, at mid-April, more or less, introduced a change in the redo log format, okay, in ODB redo log uh, format. This broke the compatibility with extra backup. So Percona is working on, uh, on the issue. It is going to release uh, a new version which understand the new format of the redo log. Um, I asked about this uh, to a Percona employee. I, I was told two days ago that um, in a few days uh, a, new, a new release uh, should, be, should be made. Um, Looking at the bug in Percona Jira, I see that the status is now pending release. Uh, it is even possible that it was released while, while we are talking, but I, I'm not checking it. Um, so I wrote some slides with actual examples of how it works, but I'm not actually going to explain the syntax and so on. Uh, I'm only interested in explaining the process here, right? Uh, so let's explain the process. First of all, uh, you always need to take a full backup, okay? Um, you specify a target directory when the backup will be placed, and you check uh, the output of extra backup. Particularly, the final line should end with completed OK, otherwise the backup failed. The second last line contains some numbers that can be useful later, uh, and uh, I will explain why. Um, sorry, I'm trying to go forward. Okay, um, restoring a full backup implies that first you need to prepare the backup, you check that the preparation was successful, and then uh, there is a simple command to uh, copy back the files in place to have MySQL running again. But it is very important to note that the preparation could fail. Uh, I mean, it doesn't happen often. And uh, even if it happens, uh, in my experience, most of the times it is not a problem. But there is a possibility that uh, preparation, interrupted preparation uh, process will ruin your backup. So I believe that before taking, uh, before starting the preparation, it is a good idea to take a backup of the backup, <laughs> even if it sounds a bit weird. Um, then uh, extra backup also allows to take incremental backups. Uh, so basically first you take a full backup and then uh, afterward, you can take an incremental backup by specifying uh, where the original full backup is located. When you take yet another incremental backup, you will need to specify where the previous uh, incremental backup is located. Um, restoring incremental backups uh, 
basically works like this. First, you prepare the full backup, and then you prepare the incremental backups in chronological order. Uh, every preparation will add uh, the missing changes to the original full backup. And finally, you will be able to restore the full backup, uh, including uh, all the changes that have been made afterwards. Um, but it is important to note a couple of things. Uh, first of all, what I said before is also true for uh, incremental backups. Uh, preparation may fail for some strange reason, and if it happens, the incremental backup could be um, ruined. Um, and for this reason, it is important uh, to take a copy of the full backup also, and also of the um, incremental backup. Um, because uh, it is also important to remember that you cannot prepare the same incremental backup twice. So this is the reason why I say you should take a backup of the full, uh, a, a copy of the full backup and a copy of the incremental backup before preparation. Um, I see a question, which backup tool is best for MySQL 8020? Well, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, it depends a lot on your needs. Uh, I would go probably for a physical copy of the files taken probably with the snapshots, but it depends a lot on your needs, on your company, and how you use MySQL. So there is not a universal answer. Uh, you may also consider, of course, to use a paid tool like MySQL Enterprise, but uh, I will not talk about it. And uh, you can also consider simply not to upgrade to the last um, MySQL 8 version until the problem is fixed uh, in Percon Extra Backup. Of course, every approach has problems. Uh, there is no perfect approach, sorry. Um, so other features of extra backup that I would like to mention uh, very quickly, because the time is short. <laughs> um, of course, it supports compressed backups. It supports uh, streaming backups uh, to send them to another server and supports choosing which databases or tables you want to backup instead of backing up the whole data. Um, there are some notes that uh, I want to share uh, about performance. Um, I know that a lot of people ignore these options, but please, <laughs> if you care about how much time your backup takes, uh, use, uh, use memory to give extra backup enough memory, uh, use threads to use a reasonable amount of threads, uh, but of course don't exceed, especially if you uh, run uh, extra backup on a server that is used by application. Um, and if IO uh, is a problem, meaning there is a risk to saturate disk IO, then also use throttle option. Uh, okay, I want to talk about the binary log. It is the last form of backup that I'm going to explain. Um, so the binary log uh, contains all the changes that have been made to the data. Um, it is used for replication because you make a change, you write something on a master, and then the master logs these changes in the binary log, and then it sends the binary log to the slaves so they can replicate these changes. Um, so every change that is logged has coordinates. I would not uh, even mention here global transaction ID because it's kind of out of topic. So um, for what we are going to discuss, coordinates are a file name and a position in that file. Um, it means the position of the of the event that, for example, is uh, it could be the last replicated event uh, for a slave. Um, when you make a full backup, you can record the coordinates of the last change that has been made. 
Um, you can use show master status for this, but I will not dig into the details. Um, if you restore a backup, you can also reapply the binary log after those coordinates, meaning that, okay, I restored the last um, full backup, and then I replay the binary log to reapply the changes that have been made to the data after the backup was taken. Okay, well, you can see an example of the syntax. Uh, as you can see, uh, they include both um, the, the file name and um, the offset in that file. But there is also an optional uh, database option that you can use, for example, if you only want to restore uh, a single database uh, and not uh, and not other databases. Um, in most cases, this is doable. Um, it probably does not make sense if you have a situation where um, a single transaction can involve more than one database, but I consider it a bad practice for several reasons uh, unrelated to MySQL performance. Uh, so let's understand how the binary log is written. Basically, it has two formats. Uh, the, the format row uh, is, I would say, the best in most cases. Uh, basically, it means that for each change, uh, the va a value of the primary key is logged, and then the new values that have been written are logged, okay? So it is kind of a binary form of the, of the changes. The other big format is statement, which is logging the original SQL statement, which made the changes of the, on the master. Problem is sometimes the same SQL statement may result in different changes if you run it twice. Why? Why? Well, for example, because you could select a random row, you could you could have an order by limit, but maybe in the order by you have a column which is not unique. Maybe you use functions like timestamp or rand, of course, or whatever. Um, these kind of statements should never be logged as a statement. Um, for this reason, there is a third um, format, which is mixed. It means that um, statement will be used only when it is safe to do so. When you run a statement which is not deterministic, then the changed rows will be logged as row format. Again, um, in most cases, I suggest to use row, but you can probably see a problem. Um, row um, contains a value of the primary key of the table, or if there is no primary key, the unique index. Problem is, if you are using tables without uh, primary keys and without unique index, it is possible that um, the row format will be slower when you try to replay a binary log or even when you replicate the change to a slave. Uh, this is a very bad practice anyway. Uh, I really suggest to always use a primary key in every table. Um, there may be exceptions, but not many, please. Um, if you use the row format, you may also want to look at bin log row image. Uh, it is a setting which controls how many information are logged. Uh, so there may be reasons to use uh, other options, but most of the times you can use minimal. Uh, what are the reasons? Well, sometimes you have a, an external tool which uses the binary log, for example, to consume it and send the data changes to some other technology, like for example, Kafka. And some of these tools actually require you 
to um, log a bit more information. Um, okay, uh, just a couple of things. Um, binary log needs to be reliable, of course, so I really suggest to always keep the checksums enabled. I know that some users tend to uh, disable checksums, but this is not a good idea usually. Um, and also, you may want to set sync bin log to one, because if you do so, in case of a server crash, uh, the binary log will always be up to date. Of course, not everyone cares about this. It depends on how you use MySQL, but I want to mention this. Um, let's go forward, but I'm having problems. Okay, good. So let's talk about the last topic, which is how and why to test backups. Um, okay, there was a poll on my website and the question was, do you test your backups? And <laughs> the answers were kind of sad for me because 25% uh, answered no, but most importantly, 60% uh, answered, I don't see why. So for this reason, I want to explain why in these slides. Uh, I will give you a couple of uh, strong examples. Um, oh, well, of course, the, the general reason is um, why to test them. Well, because something may go wrong and the backups may, may become unusable for some reason. And uh, the restore procedure also uh, may become wrong over time for some reason, because maybe you update something, maybe something changes on your server, and then you have to change your restore procedure. But if you don't test, you will not know. Um, even worse, the person who restores the backup because an incident happened may not know the restore procedure. Uh, this is a good reason to have tests, because if there is a test, well, the person will just look at tests and it, it will run um, the, the same steps. So can something really go wrong? This is a question that some of you may ask. And uh, well, let me give you a strong example. Um, Google for gitlab.com database incident. It's something that happened in 2017. Basically, um, there was an incident unrelated to backups originally. Uh, but after several hours, a person who was working to restore the services um, made a mistake and deleted uh, an important directory. Um, I think a directory with PostgreSQL data. So. Of course, they had backup strategies in place, uh, three backup strategies actually, except they didn't test them and they didn't know that none of them was working. They recovered data uh, up to six hours before the incident because fortunately, someone took a backup manually for other reasons, but they were very lucky about this. Um, Okay, don't ask me the details, please. Just Google for it because GitLab had um, a very transparent, very honest um, public postmortem. They have been great about this because you know everyone makes mistakes, and uh, if you communicate them openly, well, I I appreciate this a lot, and I forgive the the mistakes. Um, another example. Well, I already talked about this, but. Uh, on extra backup uh, simply stopped working on MySQL 8. Again, um, it is not Percona's fault. Uh, it is actually Oracle's fault because they changed something important in MySQL, even if MySQL 8 is actually a stable version that is used in production. But um, whatever the reason, the thing is, if you don't test your backups, if you use extra backup, if you update MySQL 8, well, your backup stop working. Um, and you will not even know this without tests. Um, so there are less 
spectacular reasons why a backup can go wrong. Well, of course, uh, a disk can be full. Um, there can be some version mismatch for some tools after you update something. There can be a network outage, some misconfigurations or whatever. Uh, there are really plenty of reasons why uh, something can go wrong during a backup. So, hopefully, I convinced you about this. And, um, uh, okay, I see a question. I don't know if extra backup is compatible with Veritas Symantec net backup. Uh, so, check their documentation or ask Percon about this, please. Um, so, hopefully, I convinced you to test your backups. But how to do this? Well, um, first of all, have multiple backup strategies, okay? Because even tests are not perfect. And maybe a backup stops working, but your test is not perfect, and you don't realize that the backup is not working anymore. Uh, but even if the test tells you, okay, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. User, um, the latest backup failed, well, there is a problem. You know that it failed, but it still failed, <laughs> so you don't have a, a, a recent backup. You should have multiple strategies. Um, so, okay, for each backup strategies you decide to have, please automate your backups and automate tests. And, uh, okay, mm, that said, I can suggest, for example, my favorite way to um, regularly test your backups. So basically, uh, how does it work? Well, um, you simply take the backups, for example, during the night, and then you use them to automatically feed staging databases, test databases that will be used tomorrow by uh, the developers in your company. Um, if you use different backup strategies, well, different sets of staging databases can be fed by different uh, backup types. So you can test them all. Um, if a backup stay fails, of course, the staging server uh, the day after will not be fed, but well, um, you can think about this uh, tomorrow. Hopefully, this will not be the end of the world. Um, okay, the script that restores these backups every night in staging can also be used uh, to restore them in production, okay? So in this way, you have a single procedure that is well tested and that can be used to uh, restore the backups in production. Even if you cannot use it um, exactly as it is for some reason, uh, well, at least you have good documentation about how to restore backups. So, okay, but let's talk in detail about what can be tested. How, how do you test a if a backup is working or not? Well, there are two types of tests, uh, early tests that can be done immediately after the backup is done, um, and uh, late tests that are a bit slower. So um, the early tests uh, detect if a backup failed uh, immediately, uh, very, very quickly. So you can check the exist status of, of the backup tool. You can check if the backup exists, of course, if the size is reasonable and not just, uh, for example, one byte. And if the time took by the backup procedure is reasonable, so it's not too short, but it's not too long. Because if it's too long, well, it will be a problem for other reasons. Um, Okay, this is the last technical slide. Uh, we almost finished. Um, the late tests are um, a bit more complex, so you want to do it if the backup did not fail in a very obvious way. So um, what can you do? You can, uh, well, first of all, you have to restore the backup automatically and then run these tests aut automatically. And the tests can be checked the number of tables and the number of columns. But if you don't 
If you have, for example, migrations that could run during the night, well, this test cannot be exact, okay, because maybe the migration could run before the backup, maybe it could run after the backup. So mm, you may want to tolerate a small difference to avoid useless alerts during the night. Um, then you can check if per information schema tables can be queried and they don't generate an error. You can check if regular tables can be queried and you can check sometimes, depending on your tables, you can check a small sample of rows that are not supposed to change. This is possible sometimes for read-only tables or for append-only tables. But this is the most advanced check and probably you can ignore it in most cases. Anyway, again, this was the last slide. I really wanted to take questions because I see that there were a lot of messages in the chat, um, but I cannot answer now because there is not enough time. Um, but probably I will publish on my website, federicorazzoli.com, a follow-up with answers to your questions. If you want to um, be notified about the next um, webinars, please consider subscribing to uh, my Telegram ch uh, channel, which is written in the slide. And basically you will be notified about also news about the database world. Uh, also consider using my services, of course. Um, I hope that the subliminal messages in the slides worked and you are kind of hypnotized. <laughs> of course, this is a joke. So thank you everyone and uh, see you next time.